All right, turn with me, first of all, to 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 11. So I've been teaching for a couple of weeks in Robert's class uh, this passage in 1 John chapter 3. And I want to piggyback off of it just a little bit uh, this evening in something I think will be very, very helpful for every one of us. John says, For this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And uh, he's, when he says this is the message you've heard from the beginning, John's reminding them probably of something that he wrote about, and he had heard the Lord say himself. Jesus said to them, By this shall all men know you're my disciples, that you love one another as I have loved you. And he's reminding the Ephesian church what Jesus has said. Now, when John teaches, he usually does this. He, he gives an exhortation. There's something he wants you to do. And then he turns it into a test. So the exhortation is to love one another because Jesus uh, commanded us to do so. And then he turns it into a test. And he basically says, this is a test that will show whether you are a Christian or not. It's, it's the fruit of the tree. It's the evidence that we're one of God's children. If you back up to verse 10, he says, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. In the next chapter, in chapter 4, verse 7, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So uh, John is, is, is telling them what they need to do, and that's to love other Christians. But here's something that has always been a, kind of a part of my life. When I was a, a, a baby Christian, I went to these very independent, fundamental, legalistic Baptist churches which I interpreted most of those early experiences as anything that could possibly be defined as fun was sinful. Just don't do it. We couldn't go bowling. We couldn't play Yahtzee, because you never know, you might turn into a gambler. Uh, you can't play cards. You can't, I, I, you can't go to movies. I, I wanted to go see a Billy Graham movie because I got saved listening to Billy Graham. And uh, I snuck down to the movie theater and parked my car like four blocks from the movie theater and went in and I sat and I found out that half the church was there. <laughs> you know, we, we, we don't tell each other these things. And, but one of the things I used to get in trouble over was, is, you know, fundamentals are very good about telling you what to do and what not to do. And a lot more about what not to do than what to do. But I always wanted to know how do I do that? And of course, in these churches, when you ask the question, how, you're immediately marked as a troublemaker, disrespectful. Yeah, I mean, their message is, just do it. And I'm like, well, I don't, I'd do it if I knew how to do it. They would tell you to read, 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 read your Bible, and they go, well, how do you study the Bible? There never any classes on that. So I'm kind of into the, the hows. And so John tells us in this passage that we're to love one another. But the question that I want to know is, how do I do it? How do I carry that out? And so I want us to look. And the reason I picked this out, for two reasons. Number one, it continued what I've been saying teaching in, in class the last couple of weeks, but also it fits what we've been talking about at our church this year, which is the theme is serve the Lord. Okay, so this is what I want you to see. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and this is the how. This is how one loves So let me give you a, a little a background to this uh, chapter. And remember, when you're studying any passage of Scripture before you decide what the interpretation of a text is, what's the most important thing you got to get to? Anybody besides me? Context. 
Context. You got to get a context, okay? Because uh, when you try to study the Scripture, the first thing you're trying to figure out is what did Paul meant to say to the Corinthians? Not what he's saying to you, because he didn't even know you existed. What did he mean to tell the Corinthians? So let's look at the Corinthian church real quick. And you'll see a little background about them. And in, in chapter 12, it's all about spiritual gifts. Paul is addressing the issue of spiritual gifts. He's pointing out uh, the various types of gifts. He doesn't give them all, but he gives some of them. And uh, he, uh, he is pointing out these gifts and why God gives them. And that he's pointing out also that God doesn't give everybody all the gifts or the same gifts. He just doesn't do that. Uh, and the Corinthians were using their spiritual gifts wrongly. They, they were using them to show off. They were using them to draw attention to themselves. They were using their gifts to try to get praise from people. And those kind of things. And so Paul is going to address the wrong way that they're handling the gifts that God has given them. And uh, he wants them to uh, get away from this me attitude that they have. They used all these gifts for selfish reasons. And they were often envious. If you looked at, I'm not going to look it up right now, but if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1, 1 through 3, he calls them, uh, spiritual babies, and he says that they were envious of each other. Uh, they wished they had a gift that somebody else had. I remember many, many years ago, I had a guy tell me this one time, he said, I would do anything and give anything if I could preach like you do. And this guy couldn't teach a Sunday school class. He just didn't have the gift of teaching. and uh, you know, But he was envious about it. And there are people who are envious about various things. And so they were doing this in the, in the Corinthian church. And uh, if you ever read the entire Corinthian letter, I'm sure none of you would sign up for membership here. Because they were, you talk about problems, they had four churches inside of the same church. Can you imagine that? You know, I'm with this guy, I'm with this guy, I'm with this guy. And I, I'm so spiritual, I'm with Jesus, I'm not with un, anybody else. And so they were, they, were, uh, they were doing something they shouldn't have been doing. And Paul is now going to tell them to seek something even greater than the spiritual gifts. He says, I want to show you a more excellent way. And here's what he's about to tell them. So I, I entitled my message tonight, Don't Be a Nothing. Don't be a nothing. And here's his message. He tells them that without love, your spiritual gifts add up to a big nothing. Without love, your spiritual gifts add up to zero. They're useless. And this is our message. God has given everyone in the church gifts of perhaps speaking or service. And they're a big nothing if they aren't done out of love for others. And this is what he says. So look at verse number 1 through 3. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels. And by the way, if you want to do something that you need to do, um, I don't know why they just won't do this when they translate passages of Scripture. But when you see the word tongues, what word should go there? languages they're human languages but they don't want to translate it because it doesn't sell bibles you want to sell it to the widest audience that you can which is exactly why they don't translate the word baptizo into immersion because they want to sell bibles so they they don't do that of course there's a reason why the King James translators didn't really translate the word baptizo correctly. It's because King James said that he would kill them if they did. I'd uh, so would say that was a pretty good motivation. 
to invent a brand new word that never existed before, baptize. And so it's the word uh, languages. If I speak in the, in the languages of men and of angels, but have not, have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, I'm just making a lot of, a lot of noise. And then he says, and if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. So if I had all, if I was able to imagine, there's always been people, if you live long enough, there's always somebody who suddenly has this miraculous message from God. He is, he has a mystery nobody knows, and he knows when Jesus is coming. Now, I remember when I was in Bible college, uh, there was a guy and he, and he wrote a little booklet called 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 1988. And he gave the exact hour that it was supposed to happen. And I was sitting in chapel in Bible college and I leaned over to my friend who's still a pastor today, Donnie Burford. And that when the minute went past the time, I go, we got left, brother. Yeah. But he said, even if you did know that, even if you knew everything that was in the Word of God and you didn't have love, it would be nothing. If I had all faith. You know, our, the uh, prosperity theologians, they like to make a big deal of faith. If you have enough faith, what's possible? Well, in this text it says, even if you could move a mountain with it and you did not have love, it would be nothing. I don't know why it is when these guys do that. They always have to need an offering. Kind of weird. I called them one time. You ever done that? I thought I'd have a little fun. I called them up. And they said, uh, how much? A thousand bucks. You want to put that on your, your Visa or MasterCard? Oh, no, 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 you, you misunderstand. I'm trying to bless you. I want you to have a multiplied amount of money, so I'm going to give you my address and you send me $1,000. I found out that that doesn't work in reverse. And so if I, if I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, I become a martyr, but I have not love, I gain what? Nothing. So what is the most important thing a Christian can do? Obviously, the first thing a person must do is to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. But the second one is love. It should be our all of us who are believers, this should be our highest priority. Now, what is biblical love? A lot of people try to define it. How many of you have ever Googled it before? You know, it's got that Greek word agape. Oh my, you'll get such a list of, of things. And here in Paul's letter to, in 1 Corinthians 13... Here's what he says it is. He doesn't really give a definition. And the reason he doesn't give a definition is because agape love cannot be defined. You can't do it. And this text points out why you can't do it. Because love is not a descriptive thing. Now, I'm not real good with, uh, you know, I like listening to Pastor Matt when he talks about language because I'm, I'm pretty good with Greek and I'm pretty good with Hebrew and probably the worst I'm at is English. And, uh, you know, when I get an English lesson, I go, you know, okay, you know, uh, that's just, I had a really hard time in Bible college with English. And, uh, and, but if I wanted to describe something, what English item would I use? 
Okay, school teachers. Adjectives. There are no adjectives here. In verses 4 through 7, there's no adjectives. Guess what's there? Verbs. And what are verbs? They're action words. Love isn't something you describe. Love isn't something you define. Love is something you do. It's an action thing. It's something that you do. And so he lists 15 things here. We're not going to get to all 15, um, but we'll cover as many of them as I can next week uh, as we continue this this series of, of studies on this passage. It's an action word. So it, love does this, and love doesn't do that. That's kind of what it does. Love does this, and it doesn't do that. Therefore, in our culture, love is primarily a wad. A feeling. Many churches are programmed to produce feelings. That is not love. Love is not a feeling. It is something you do. It's always something you choose to do. You can even choose to do it even if you don't feel like it. If you're married, you want to listen to this. Hey, listen, if you, if, if you married people would listen to me very carefully tonight, <clears throat> we would never have any marital issues in our church. I'm serious. When I do premarital counseling when I was a pastor, this is where we go. Right there. And if they have a problem later on, they come back, they go, oh, you remember this lesson? Let's go back to it. Broke that, didn't you? And so we want to look at this really, really carefully. So I'm going to just give you the first two tonight. And the first two, it will change your life when it comes to your marriage. It'll change your life when it comes to friendships and every, every relationship in life. So the first thing it says, love is patient. Now, this word is a word that is often completely misunderstood. Uh, patient doesn't mean that I don't yell at the guy who cuts me off on the interstate. I mean, that's a pretty simplistic idea of patience. Here's what the word patience means. The word patient means to endure hurt, or suffering without any thoughts of retaliating. Now, the Corinthian church, if you study them, no doubt they had a lot of hurt going on, and they had a lot of retaliating going on in, in that church. And we have many examples in the Scripture to encourage us to be patient. And let me give you just a few of them. When Jesus hung on the cross... Would you not say that everybody determined would, would, had earned destruction? If God had killed everybody in that second, would it have been unjust? In fact, he could have done it before they even got him on the cross. He could have got him in the trial. But instead, he went through the trial. And did he retaliate? No. Was he thinking about retaliating? No. He went through the scourging, which was terrible. Still nothing. They put him on the cross in six long days hours go by people taunted him and dared him to do something and what did he do he stayed on the cross and then he probably said something in a very low voice father forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. 
That's Jesus. Let me give you a few more. In Romans chapter 2, verse 3, pastor preached on this not too long ago. In Romans chapter 2, verse number 3, he says, Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things, and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you preserve, presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. There used to be a famous atheist named Robert Ingersoll. Anybody remember Robert Ingersoll? He used to do this all the time in his classes when he taught, and he would say, he would blaspheme the Lord, and he said, I dare him to kill me. And after a few minutes went by, he would say, see, I have proved to you that God does not exist he did not prove that god did not exist what he proved was is that god is patient he should and could have killed him and he didn't every single time consider this how many of you realize how many of you have sinned today anybody not because uh, we need to have a talk. Start with lying. How many of you realize, how many sins did it take in the Garden of Eden to get the death sentence? I can prove it to you. Anybody seen Adam lately? Do you realize that every single sin you commit is deserving of death? And somehow, when you got up this morning to the time you got here today, and the sins that were in between, God didn't kill you. Isn't that a patient God? Maybe if we started to think like that, that every sin is worth a death sentence, we might, we're not going to possibly not sin anymore, but it might slow it down just a bit, right? Because we start to realize how serious sin is. Think about God's patience with Adam. Now, you know, when, when Adam sinned, God to, what did God tell him? You're going to die. And when did he say you were going to die? The day you eat of the fruit of that tree. So when God came calling for him, he hid. What did he think God was going to do? Kill him. Now he died spiritually that day, but scripture tells us he lived how many more years? 930. That's a, that's a patient God that he didn't do that. Consider Noah's time. At what point during the 120 years of the building of the ark did everyone deserve to be killed? That would be right at the get-go. When did God finally do it? 120 years later some every once in a while here chris is like boy god's got to get america you really think he works that fast i, I can kind of prove that to you consider the nation of israel if you start reading in the book of uh, from genesis chapter 12 and you start reading forward guess what you find page after page after page after page chapter after chapter israel keeps Messing up. They're still messing up. Even after all of these years. Do you know there are more atheistic Jews than there are Jews that believe God exists? One of the proofs that God is a patient God 
is that there's a Jew still breathing on this planet. God is patient. Now that kind of patience is what God is calling us to do. But we can't do this on our own. That's why we have to walk with the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is, what's the first one? Love. There's nine of them there. And the first one is love. It's the most important one. All the other items that are listed there as the fruit of the Spirit flow from that one thing. So if you were to focus on that one thing, the other thing, eight things would flow out of it. Well, I could spend a lot of time on that because that helps people in numerous ways. And it is, Paul says, the most important thing, that I am nothing without this love, and the Spirit makes that the first thing. And what the Spirit does when we walk by the Spirit is the first thing He does, He strengthens us. He enables to do something that we can't naturally do in our flesh. Now, all of us are different. I have no doubt there's, we have a range of people who are fairly passive in this room to hotheads. And you know how a hothead is. It doesn't take much to get them to go off. And it's like living with pins and needles around people like that or walk around on eggshells in your house. And so the Spirit, first of all, strengthens us, and then He gives us a motivation to be patient. So how, how does He do that? How does he influence and motivate us to be patient with others? Well, the first thing that Scripture says in Philippians 2.13, that it's God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So he works inside of you in the first place. And it is also the Holy Spirit who operates in us to conform us into the likeness of Christ, to imitate what Christ does. I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, verse 16 real quick. I want you to see this passage of Scripture. And sometimes we need motivation to do things. So, you know, when somebody, somebody hurts me in some way, shape, or form, I have, I have a choice to make. I can either think about that, or I can think about this. In chapter 5, verse 16, it says, In the same way, let your light, your light shine before others so that they may see your good works, and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And so our motivation would be to please God, to be more like Jesus, and to work to glorify God. So I, I kind of need to ask myself, I maybe talk to yourself. Is it, anybody do that besides me? Oh, there's just one. Anybody else? Are you nice to yourself? I always find it interesting. Some people, they talk nasty to themselves, then somebody else says exactly what they say to themselves, and they're outraged. Never figured that out. But you should talk to yourself. You, got to, you know, I had to learn to do this. I did not have a pastor for 35 years. So guess who I hired to be my pastor? Me. And so I would talk to myself. You know, if you live long enough, people start walking in your office thinking, mm, I think Ken's losing it. It's okay to talk to yourself as long as you know there, there's not somebody else there. But here's what I would say to myself. I would ask myself questions. For instance, I would say, do I wish to do God's will? Is that what I want to do? I might ask, do I want to be like Christ? I would ask, do I want to glorify God? And see, when we ask those questions, the Holy Spirit begins to work in us. It gets the operation of the Spirit going. So love is patient, but it's, it, there's a second part to this, because if you do the second part, you won't have too much problem with the first part. And love is kind. So what does this mean? This means that you're absolutely determined to do good to others and nothing else, to do good to others. Sometimes uh, correcting people is not evil. That can be a good thing. Loving kindness 
is something we want to do. Consider the loving kindness of God. Turn with me to Titus chapter 3 and verse number 3. It says this, For we ourselves were once foolish. All right, amen. How many of you realize that at one time you were a fool? You know, so if somebody ever calls you a fool, they're, they're probably not wrong. Disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Spirit. So here we were doing all of these terrible things, and what happened? The loving kindness of God appeared. He, 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 instead of giving us what we deserved, He decided... I'm going to do good to you. How many of you, God's still doing good to you? And how much of that do you deserve? There should never be a reason a Christian belly aches and complains because you never deserve anything anyway. God is kind and He does you good. In Matthew chapter 11, I want you to see this because this one is one that gets quoted a lot, but not a lot of people know really what it's saying. How many of you have ever been spiritually wore out? H have you? You ever been spiritually just... Have you ever said to yourself, I just don't know if I can take much more? I've had many days like that in the ministry. Just completely a mess. And Matthew 11 always speaks to me. Look what it says in verse number 28. He says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. You know, sometimes, sometimes serving the Lord can make the burdens so heavy they feel like they're crushing you. And he says for he says take he says and I he says come to me all who labor and heavy laden and I will give you rest. That word rest means vacation. I always loved that, you know, because when I was a pastor, I didn't, I didn't always have time to go and take a vacation when I was wore out. But I could find a vacation with Jesus. And now look what he says. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That word rest is the word for kindness. You will find a God who will do kind things to you. I love that passage. And of course, we all know Romans eight twenty eight: all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. God is determined to do good to us. And we deserve none of it. None of it. Have you ever sat down, you know? I, I, I'm still a lover of a, not all the hymns. Some of the hymns are not biblical. But I'm a lover of a lot of hymns. And one of my favorite hymns is Count Your Blessings. Name them one by one. Have you ever named your blessings? Take a sheet of paper out and start writing down your blessings. How many of you who are married are so glad that God gave you your spouse? I. Right. 
God's good. God went to a lot of trouble to get me to a net. He had to get me ordered to the drill sergeant academy at Fort Sill, Oklahoma for it to happen. He had to get someone to make the biggest ad in the yellow pages. I'm sure some of you can't associate with this. In the yellow pages, Bethel Baptist Church, where I went and met her. What about my, your children? Your family? I, I didn't have a great mother. I would never had a father. But many, every year, some of you, Mother's Day is so sweet. And Father's Day is so special. And you know, some of you say, Dad, and I never got to say that in my entire life. Not even once. That's a blessing. How many of you realize it's a blessing to be in this church? It's a blessing to be saved. It's a blessing to have friends. Some of you, I look around this room and, and uh, you know, it, it's great that because you're my friends and I, I, I'm, not the, I'm not the pastor. I don't have anything to give you. We're just friends because we love each other. I like that. There's so many things. I've lived longer than I thought I would. I'm happy to know that at 69, my mind hasn't lost, gone from me yet. I think. I'm sure somebody will tell me when that day comes. But when we have a thankful heart, we begin to realize God's great goodness to us. And that's what we're to do. We're to have that kind of a life that wants to do good to other people. You know, sometimes even the smallest things, they, they may not seem big, but they're really, really big. So there are a few people, or reasons we ended up even, when we came to visit this church and walked in the door, I would have never even got in to listen to Pastor Matt preach if it had not been for a few people. We had been to a church where people just don't talk to you. You're not welcome there. And I was looking for a welcoming church that preached God's Word. And when I walked in, I told him that when I got out of the car, so help me if nobody speaks to me in three minutes, we're leaving. I walked in the door, and guess who was I was greeted by? Steve and Scott and Michael and Roseanne. I remember my third time to this church, Michael and Roseanne were at the door, and I walked in, and they said, you're Kim, and you're Annette, and this is your third time here, and I'm like, what church does that? What church does that? You know, then I went to the second service most of the time, and, it, and then, but then I, I got started teaching the other hour, and so I started coming to the first service, and everybody seemed to know me, and I'm like, who are you? And it was like, uh, this is Cross Point Church 2.0. This is the other church, you know. And, and, but friendly people everywhere. Friendliness brought us here to this church. And so we have to d- determine to use our gifts in order to be kind to other people. Let me give you another, another example of kindness. It was Jonathan, Saul's son. He had something to lose with David. He would have been the king. But Saul, Saul hated David. He tried to kill him over and over again. He'd say, come in and play your, you know, your musical instrument to me. And David had to play the musical instruments as he dodged the spears. How many of you would like to play that game? And, and all kinds of terrible things. And yet, guess what the scripture says about Jonathan? He's, it says, Jonathan loved David more than his own soul. He just did good to David over and over and over again. And back in, in Old Testament times, when a king died, you didn't just kill the king, but you killed all of his relatives too. And he didn't do that. David was even kind to 
one of his other sons, Mephibosheth. And then I, this is a secular story. I, I, I debated whether I should include this, but I will. One of the kindest presidents we ever had in our nation was Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was known as a man who never spoke evil of his enemies. He was kind. He did good to people. And while he was about to become president, there was one man in particular that really hated Abraham Lincoln. His name was Henry Stanton. In fact, he used to uh, say really horrible things like uh, that Abraham Lincoln comes from baboons. I mean, he was just a terrible person. Then Abraham Lincoln got elected president. And when he got elected president, they're sitting in the room deciding who's going to be in the cabinet. And they brought up the Secretary of War position. And Abraham Lincoln said, Henry Stanton. And they all looked at him like, are you serious? This is one of your worst enemies. He said, he is the, he's a good man. He's the best man for this job. And Henry Stanton became on Lincoln's cabinet. And if you ever get to go to the place and the room where Abraham Lincoln died after he was shot. There's a picture of them all gathered around in the room, and there was Henry Stanton, and he looked down at Abraham Lincoln as he died, and he said, there goes a man for the ages. Abraham Lincoln had won that man over. I remember in my last few couple years as a pastor, I had nine people vote against me as uh, become pastor. I only got 84% uh, of the vote, I think. Anyway, one guy, he, uh, he wasn't real nice to me for a few years. And uh, he got cancer and he started to die and I went over to his house, me and my wife, and and uh, this was the last time I would ever see him. And uh, Carl thought he had another month to live, but he didn't. He didn't even have another day. And Carl said to me, he said, I was one of the people that voted against you. I'm so sorry I did that. He said, I'm so glad you were my pastor. How did I do it? I killed him with kindness. That's what I did. And every Christian, if every Christian did these two things, now listen, married people, if you're not married, listen, because you need to do this when you do. Imagine how every relationship and every marriage would be different. Imagine when your spouse says or does something that makes you mad, hurts your feelings, or does some retaliatory thing, and, and instead you instantly decided instead of retaliating, you just went and did something special for them. Wouldn't that blow their mind? I don't think there would be a marital problem in the church if everybody did that. That's great marriage counseling, by the way. Just do that. And, uh, your conflicts never last very long. Now, my wife is the best example of this scripture tonight. I'm, I'd like to say I am, but it just isn't true. She always gets to I'm sorry first. And by the time she's to I'm sorry, which is pretty fast, I'm not feeling like being very forgiving. And I almost want to say, I will forgive you. Give me another 30 minutes. 
And uh, sometimes it's like that. Sometimes we're, we, we, it, we need to even show kindness to our enemies. What does the Bible say we're to do to our enemies? Huh? Love your enemies. Now, it, it, notice it doesn't say. Make sure you have warm, deep, fuzzy feelings for your enemies. Because that would be a lie. It doesn't say you have to have warm, fuzzy feelings. You, you don't have to have warm, fuzzy feelings about everybody you know. I don't. I mean, I've always had people like, oh, here they come. They're going to say hi. And, uh, you know, you, 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 there's just some people you don't. But you know what? You still can decide, what does it say, to your enemies. Do good to them. And when you speak to them, your words are to be blessings and not cursings. Everything's designed to build people up. You can even rebuke a person and do that. Depends on how you do it. I used to have this chaplain, and he would rebuke me every once in a while, but he was so good at it, I would go to another floor and talk to another chaplain and say, I think Chaplain Carmichael just chewed me out. I'm not sure, but I think he did. He was so good at it. I never met anybody who was as good at this text as he was. And he was a Methodist. That was a problem for me back in the day. Like, oh, it can't be a Methodist. It should be a Baptist, but it was a Methodist. God taught me a lesson that, that time. And so we, it, it, it's, we have to do that. Why? Because we want to do what? Glorify God. We want to be like Jesus. We want to please the Lord. And so we, we do that. The question Paul has as we close this evening is, in this text, if you want to be something, and it's not wrong to want to be somebody. I mean, I've never heard anybody go, well, what I'm shooting for in life is to be nobody. If you want to be somebody, and there's nothing wrong with that, if you want your service for God to be pleasing to the Lord, if you want your gifts to be used as God intended, then you must use your gifts with love. The desire to do something good for others. Others have to be your focus. It just has to be. I close with this. I'm not really interested in whether you, I'm at the point in my life where I don't care whether people agree with my messages or not. I, I'm not like trying to have preaching Olympics where we all put up a card and Kim gets a six or a four. I don't really care. Here's what I care about. What I care about is that you evaluate yourself. How many of you can say, I, I just don't ha need to improve in, in this area. I'm sure if you think just a little bit, you may be, in, I've had people who broke this on in their car on the way to church. And you think about it, you evaluate it, and you can see countless failures in these areas we need to evaluate ourselves and ask ourselves, is love is the priority of your life? And Paul says it is the most important thing as a Christian. And despite the fact that we've all failed many times, let us determine to grow in love for the glory of God. My desire for us tonight, including myself, is that I please the Lord, that I glorify Him, that I grow in love. And when I consider all the things love does and does not do in this text, I want to tell you, I want your last thoughts of this message to be on Jesus. This text just makes me just, I'm in awe of Jesus. I know no one Who's very good at this? 
including myself. But Jesus was perfect. He did it right. He knew a lot more people. He was around a lot more people than you'll ever know in your life. And he loved perfectly. Every single time. Whether he was tired. Sometimes a little discouraged with his disciples. Yet, he always loved perfectly. I remember in Scripture the last time he ever saw Judas Iscariot alive on this earth. As, G as Judas walked up to him to betray him, and he knew he was coming to do that. The last words Judas ever heard Jesus say was this, Friend, why have you come? One last invitation. You know, Scripture says that God is not willing that any should perish. Why? Because He's patient. That He's kind. I think of the time when I can't imagine anybody being hurt more than Jesus was. That night, He heard the man who said, I don't care if everybody on this planet forsakes you. It won't be me. I'll die for you. And in a few hours, he was denying Christ three times. Can you imagine what Peter must have thought when they met the disciples up in Galilee and he took Peter by himself off to the side to talk to him. You know, there was one thing that Peter knew. You know what he knew? He knew Jesus loved him. Even though he had failed so badly. In our modern world, we would not pick that man to preach the sermon on the day of Pentecost. And he asked him three times, do you love me? As he dug deeper into Peter's sinful pride. And he didn't look at Peter and go, I'm done with you. What did he say to him? Feed my sheep. Jesus was patient with him. And he was kind to him. And Peter was never the same, was he? He was never, ever the same. I love Jesus all the more because of this text, because I see in this text something that only he could do. Boy, and I praise him for it. And I'm glad he's like that now. And always is like this. Amen? How many of you are glad you have a, a Savior like that? And I'm so grateful for that. So let us, you know, y'all do, I'm just, I'm not here chewing on you. So many in this church, are they do such a good job with this. Amen? I see people all over this church who serve and I feel love from them. There are a lot of churches you could probably chew on. This ain't one of them. But this is to remind you to make this your motivation. Why are you serving? Serve out of love. And I feel that all the time in this place i hope you do too and don't be satisfied with where you're at by the way you can grow in this get a little better 
Some of you aren't too as fuzzy as other people. Y'all know me. Some people are scared for me to say hi to them because they know this means several minutes. Boom. You know, I always get a kick out of Brother Jim. He goes, hi, Kim, I got to go. <laughs> and it never offends me because when I started here, I told him he could do that, didn't I? I said, you know, because it doesn't bother me. I, I talk and I talk and I talk and I talk and I talk because I'm an extrovert. I just don't, people just don't tire me out. But not everybody is. So if you're a little introverted, try to stretch yourself out just a little bit. And if you're extroverted, you may, my wife tries to get me to dial back just a hair. And uh, so I'm not doing too good at that, I don't think. But we can do better, amen? And so Sunday comes, people walk in the doors every week, don't they? Every week people walk into our doors, look around, see them. Maybe they're like me, they're looking for somebody to talk to them. And we want that to happen. We want people to hear God's word preached, which it does happen in our church all the time. But we want to hear, we want to see people loved too. And these are the two most important things, right? Is to believe the gospel and to love one another. All right. Well, I went two minutes over. And as my wife would tell me, Kim, it is time to land the plane. Did I help anybody tonight? I encourage him by night. Man, I get, I mean, I get super excited to be able to encourage people. I really do. It just, uh, just makes my day when I get to do that. Let's pray and, and, uh, let's, uh, ask the Lord to help us with this task.